Join me in welcoming to the podium my friend, your friend, Andrew Lawton. In my defense, they never invited me back. <laughs> Thank you for that very, very warm and kind welcome, Tracy and everyone. It's my great privilege to be here. I almost didn't make it. As people who have observed politics will know, nothing is working in this country. And to fly from London to Ottawa, which I could have driven twice in the amount of time it took me to fly yesterday, the last step was an overbooked flight where they offered people $1,200 to not take it. And I was tempted until I remembered my position on buybacks, which was not favorable. So I took the flight and I got here. Generally speaking, and when I was invited to come, I, I try to avoid Ottawa, but I made an exception for, for you fine folks, and I, I know that obviously it's a bit of a busy time. I know that the, the wildfires have been uh, changing the landscape a little bit. I must admit, I, when I first saw all of the smokiness last week, and I just thought range day had a really high attendance this year, and then I learned it wasn't actually the plume of, uh, of gunpowder in the air from all of you, but it was something else that uh, Justin Trudeau now wants to ban things over. So uh, we will talk about that and we'll talk about more. And I, I want to just begin by situating the media landscape, which I think is so critical in understanding the political landscape. And there are many reasons for this, and I think all of us in this room, whether you're a gun owner or a very patient spouse who's been uh, dragged along here, will, of which there are probably a few, I just know my own patient spouse gets dragged places, you'll likely know that you are not a group that the media really cares about. That's not to say you're a group the media ignores. I think Tracy knows that better than anyone else. And I should just say my first exposure to the CCFR was an alliterative headline about the gun goddess of Ottawa uh, back in 2016. There she is. Give a round of applause to the go goddess herself. <laughs> and I became very quickly enamored, not just with Tracy and, and also with Rod in a very different way, admittedly, when I saw that CCFR was doing, I think, something very important. It was advocating for gun owners, not just uh, going to the gun range with Stephen Blaney, but actually trying to move the narrative forward, which is so key. It's one thing to lobby a government that's on side with you. It's another thing to actually try to bring a population that is not on side with you along. And I think that's where I decided to, as I started to become more well-versed in this issue, and go through the process of becoming a, a firearms license holder and then a, a firearms owner myself, I realize that the media has a critical role to play. And the media does not play this role particularly well. Part of the problem with media bias on guns is a complete lack of understanding. You have people that have gone to journalism programs in, well, you can't say Ryerson anymore because it's a hate crime, but they've gone to uh, Toronto Metropolitan Bland University, and they've uh, never seen a firearm in their life. They go to a newsroom in rural Saskatchewan because it's the first job available in CBC's uh, division there in Regina or Saskatoon or somewhere else, and they have never encountered firearms, but all of a sudden are living in a community that shockingly has firearms owners. And one amusing example in my old newsroom in London, Ontario, the London police had arrested someone for something or other, and they had seized like 200 rounds of ammunition. And I remember people thinking, oh, wow, he had 200 bullets. And I'm like, I think I have 200 bullets in my pocket right now. Um, and there was another one, same city, same newsroom, not to pick on them, but it's where my experiences were in, in London. The police sent out a press release about arresting someone and seizing a bolt-action semi-automatic rifle. <laughs> and I was new to guns at the time, but still thought, I don't think that exists. And of course, in the newsroom, they say, oh, well, police say they seized a bolt-action semi-automatic rifle. And I think it was in the London Free Press, AM980, and CBC London, all reported this unquestioningly because there was no one that looked at that and said, that doesn't make sense. 
Admittedly, that's a common trend for CBC reporters, but that's another story. So journalists, I believe, have an obligation to want to know about what it is they cover. And there are great gun owners that have tried to be ambassadors, and I know from experience, have reached out to journalists and people in the media and said, you know, you should come out to a range. And there was one in the U.S. a little while ago, I can't remember his name, but to his credit, he said, I'm going to go to the range. It doesn't always work, because he thought that firing an AR-15 was the most terrifying experience someone could have in their life, and he was complaining about the recoil which I believe many, exactly, everyone in the room knows why that's crazy, but you tell that story in Toronto and they're like, and? <laughs> but it's important for people to know it. And I remember there was a gentleman who uh, was very active in London in the firearms community that said, you go to all your colleagues and ask them if they want to come out to uh, the shooting range. And I did. And some of them were like, you know, I think that's something that I would benefit from. I think I, I, think I would do that. But there were a couple that said, no. I don't like guns, I don't want to like guns, and I don't want anything to do with guns. And who do you think are the most prone to write about firearms in the news? It's those people that don't understand it, don't want to understand it, and by extension don't understand any of the issues related to it. But I share that so that you understand when the media gets it wrong, there are people in that group that are getting it wrong because they don't know. And I think the response should be to give them an opportunity to know. And I think outreach is very important. If you are a member of a range, if you're the owner of a range, or if you're the owner of a gun store, I would encourage you to just send a friendly note to your local journalist and say, hey, I know these things will come up. I would love to just give you a little bit of exposure and access to it. Not looking for coverage, I'm just looking for you to be able to have a little bit of background and to have in your back pocket my name and number when something does come up. But the flip side of that is that you're going to come up against people that are completely blissful in their ignorance. And those people you need to fight fire with fire on. You need to call out the bias. You need to call out the misinformation. You need to pull a Tracy, as I believe the verb is. And you need to actually assert the truth. But there is a bit of comfort that I take in the fact that it is the truth. It's very difficult to fight a losing battle. It's especially difficult if you are not in the right. Tracy very kindly mentioned the documentary series I put together in 2021 called Assaulted, Justin Trudeau's War on Gun Owners. And I was very grateful to have CCFR support on that. I was especially grateful to be doing it in April 2021 because it gave me an excuse to travel when that was essentially illegal. And it was an opportunity to talk to some people that are in this room. Uh, Rod was in it, uh, Scott Carpenter back there. I don't know if anyone else uh, here was in that. But we went across the country and we spoke to people that were affected by, at the time, the order in council, which was the big injustice that I think by 2021 gun owners were, were really paying attention to. And in doing so, we tried to focus on the law enforcement crime angle the business angle, the sport shooting angle, and the gun business angle. And in doing so, we were humanizing people that were affected by this in a way that I don't think the media, generally speaking, was doing. Now, the one thing I will caution you on is that while we did succeed in changing minds, I know because I heard from people, we didn't change policy. The situations we talked about in that documentary have gotten worse. Businesses I spoke to who had had inventory in their warehouses that they couldn't move for at the time 11 months have now had two more years of that same inventory sitting in the same warehouses. We've seen more bans now. We've seen the handgun ban come into effect since then, or as I call it, the greatest handgun sales pitch in the history of the world. I got one in August, by the way. And the thing that I would, yeah, well, a lot of people did, and I, I think it's one thing to enjoy that when these attempts to ban things end up selling more of them, but it also reminds us that we are engaged in a hobby that is under the boot of government and will always be unless you have a government that starts to take these things very seriously and, and roll these back. But to return to the documentary, I, I use my mother, who is a great barometer on political issues, because she is not hyper-engaged, and I think it's very useful, because if I want to know what normal people 
of which I am not, think about things, I can talk to her. She does not like guns. How she ended up with a husband and two sons that do is probably a, a question she asked herself many times. But she saw assaulted because she's very loving and supports the work that I do and says, okay, well, I don't like them, but that doesn't seem fair. I will take it. <laughs> I will take that. And I think that for a lot of people, if they learn the facts, that's where they will go. Maybe they're not going to come out to the range. Maybe they're not going to buy an AR-15 or a handgun or anything else. But they will understand the fundamental injustice in a group of people who are safe, licensed, diligent about following regulations to the letter and finding themselves with no property rights and being smeared, tarnished, and slandered at every turn. And that is the critical juncture. That should be the goal. The goal should be getting people that are otherwise indifferent or apathetic, not to love you, but to tolerate you. And that seems like a low bar, but I think it's an important one. And for people who know Ottawa very well, interestingly enough, we're in the adjacent parking lot to uh, one of the main sites of the Freedom Convoy, which I, I wrote about extensively. And I, I don't want to get too controversial because I, I don't know where everyone stands on that. But the one thing I will say about the fight we saw over vaccine mandates and against COVID restrictions is that it was, generally speaking, a minority that was having to fight. I mean, most Canadians were vaccinated, so people that were unvaccinated were just a statistical minority. Being a minority doesn't mean you're wrong, it just means that you have an uphill battle to try to win people over. Gun owners are in the same boat. We can talk about there being safety in numbers. We can talk about how there are millions, but it's still not the majority. So it is very difficult if you are standing with someone who has never seen a gun, doesn't need a gun, doesn't think they need a gun, and you're trying to tell them why this is so important to your way of life, there's going to be a disconnect there. And I do believe that you have to meet people where they are, and you have to meet people in the middle. One of the great stories I find in, in Canadians' history of firearms regulations is when the former mayor of Toronto, David Miller, one day learned that Union Station had a gun club which mortified him because this place that he had been to a thousand times was all of a sudden unsafe. The only thing that changed was his knowledge. The situation didn't change, but of course David Miller made it his mission to end that and in Toronto the firearms landscape is among the worst in the country. So there aren't going to be wins at every turn. But you have to believe that when you are on the right side, you will win people over when you reach them. So I wanted to pivot from there and explain the points that I believe are the most saleable. And I, I'm not telling anyone in this room how to be an advocate for your community, how to do your jobs. I, I'm merely sharing my observations of things that have worked when I've covered this issue. One is the Olympic angle. And this was interesting because for me, I have never been a competitive sport shooter and anyone who's seen me shoot will know why. But the one thing that is interesting about it is that Canadians love their Olympians. Canadians love national pride. Canadians love athletic achievement. A lot of Canadians are shocked to learn that there is such a thing as Olympic shooting. And that was, it ended up being a, a very interesting angle. I spoke to a, a couple of Canada's uh, great uh, Olympic shooters, one of them, Linda Keiko, who competed in the Olympics not that long ago. And when people saw that segment in Assaulted, and they realized all of these people who represent Canada that are you know, literally wearing the Canadian flag when they go around the world, are now uncertain if they'll be able to compete, or uncertain if they'll be able to train. And the government, answers this by saying, fine, we'll, we'll, carve out a little, we'll carve out a little hole for them. But that doesn't solve the problem. And in fact, what about the next generation of athletes? What about the ones that needed exposure to that hobby to learn that, hey, this is kind of something I'm good at that I can go and win a gold medal in? The government's not interested in those folks. And then when you get to the non-Olympic shooting sports, nobody needs a handgun. One woman I spoke to says, well, what am I going to do? Use my fingers and point? Well, that's basically, I, I said, don't give, her, don't give them any ideas because that is where we're headed. 
It'll be the elastic band IPSC. It's uh, coming soon. It's all the rage across Toronto. But the baffling part of this is that Canadians just don't know because they don't think about these issues. When a government says handgun, the word handgun, people don't think of a shooting sport they've never engaged in. They don't think of a hobby collector that they've never met. They think of the only exposure they get to firearms, which is firearms crime. And you can understand how for people in this room it's very different. When you hear a gun, you think of that thing I did on the weekend. You think of all the people I know. You think of all of the people in this room. But if you don't have that community, your association is the one that is given to you by the press and given to you by the government and given to you by activists that are all too willing and all too eager to remind people of the horrors of gun crime, which, shockingly, everyone in this room understands. And everyone in this room is on side in. And everyone in this room is even more mortified by people that use firearms unsafely. And there was a friend of mine that said, well, I don't know how careful gun owners really are. And, and I said, you post, post a picture of yourself with your finger on the trigger on Facebook and you read the comments and boy, will you find out how diligent they are. <laughs> and I think that is actually quite important. If people realized just how diligent gun owners are. They would not at all buy into the hype. So we go back to how do you tell that story. You have a media that is not going to run a story on, hey, everything's fine today. Because that's not news, that doesn't sell papers, that doesn't drive clicks, and it doesn't make for compelling television. So, hey, two million gun owners didn't shoot anyone today is not a headline you're ever going to see. But it's a story we nonetheless need to tell. I make a point any time there is a horrific event, and Porta Peak, Nova Scotia became one of the more recent and and salient ones, and shockingly to no one in this room, it had nothing to do with licensed gun owners, and it had nothing to do with lawful firearms. Oddly, I found that narrative actually did seep in, eventually. It didn't stop the government in its tracks, but there were reporters that started to say, well, hang on. The government is overplaying its hand here. They're saying that all of this would be affected by this. And then you fast forward to today, and no one in the government has been able to answer how they would have prevented that with any of the regulations that have come in since. Absolutely, I saw a zero. That's probably negative zero. Negative is probably less than that. But because all of these regulations, all of these reforms, all of these bans, lull people into this false sense of security to think, oh, the government's taking action. The government's doing something about it. And it's great for politics. It's bad for policy. So people will oftentimes focus on the stories that, as I mentioned a few moments ago, that they resonate with, that they understand. And we understand horror. I mean, you look at stories in the U.S. all the time of of mass shootings. People understand that. One of the most dangerous realities of Canadian politics is the tendency to import American fights. We import American fights on race. We import American fights on firearms. We import American fights on every conceivable subject imaginable when we do not have the same history. We do not have the same laws. We do not have the same constitution, the same political culture, the same media landscape. We are two different countries that have a lot in common, but a lot not in common. And that American import is one of the more insidious dimensions of Canada's political culture. For starters, because we surrender our own national story in a way when we feel the need to pick up these fights. It's not we, but we are the bystanders in it or the victims of it. But I think the government needs to be called on that. When they say, well, hang on, there was this shooting in the U.S., we have to get serious about guns. We are serious about guns. You talk to even your average American rural Democrat about Canada's gun laws and they'd think we were living in North Korea. (laughs) Because Canada does have strict and stringent gun laws. And I find quizzing people is kind of important. How do you get a handgun? Anyone who tells, tells you we shouldn't have guns, ask them how they get one. They don't know. They do not know. I mean, yeah, in Toronto, maybe you can go to the back of some apartment building in Etobicoke and get one, but 
To get one legally, I actually am convinced that people don't know because they've never thought of it. So the strategy, if you want to bring this back to communications, is make people think about it. Make people think about it in a way that goes beyond just the top line. I, I'm a big fan of the slogan, firearm rights are human rights, because they are. But if someone doesn't care about firearms, it's very difficult to make them on side with you with an appeal to firearm rights. People understand property rights, though. And one of the more compelling angles I've found through producing Assaulted and also through other coverage is that people understand the idea of their property being taken away from them. People understand the idea of their land being reclassified or rezoned. People understand all of these parallels and analogs, and I don't, I don't support being dishonest, but you have to make the appeal on firearms issues relevant to people that don't care about guns. And I think that's often where gun owners have missed the mark or have not gone as far as they need to, and that they assume that just because we care about something, other people will as well. And just because we value something, other people will as well. And look, there are many, many reasons in stories that we see across the country where people use their firearms legally in self-defense, and notwithstanding the way that that's treated by the law, eventually they will be exonerated. But if someone doesn't feel threatened, the self-defense angle isn't going to win them over. If someone doesn't care about this hobby, we've all heard, but why do you need to do that? Why can't you just take up knitting? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you have to be able to argue this issue in a way where you're appealing to something that someone already values. And I think that rights and freedoms talks can be very challenging in this regard. And whether we're talking about free speech, whether we're talking about academic freedom, whether we're talking about freedom on medical choice, on any number of things, we often get focused on the outcome and not the core underlying first principle of it. So owning a firearm is not an important right because we have a right to bear arms in Canada. It's important because you have a right to own whatever you want within constraints that I'm not going to define because I think they're so self-evident. You have the right to own a car, the right to own a cup of coffee, the right to own a house. It doesn't mean the ability to own a house, but guns are more affordable. So that's where I would recommend the discussion shift. And if I were to re recreate Assaulted or some other version of it, first off, I'd love to work with CCFR again because I think they're doing tremendous work on this and all of you should be commended for doing it by being here and not just giving up and not just saying, you know what, I'm just going to get rid of these things because it's not worth the hassle. But if I were to recreate it, I would focus on telling more of those human stories of people who did nothing wrong but are vilified and targeted and maligned. And the one example, and if you haven't watched it I, and you don't have time, it's only, I think, about 50 minutes, the whole thing, but the one most fascinating interview I did was with a, a couple from, I forget the, the town in Alberta, uh, the, the singers. And they had created this gun specifically as a non-restricted firearm for the sole purpose of being a gun that would meet their needs living out on a farm and living out on a ranch. And it was a, an interesting interview because they were skeptical of me because they heard a journalist was coming in and thankfully Rod interceded on my, my behalf and they realized I was one of the good ones or so I thought. And I, I went there and this Adonis-like man comes out and has the sun beating behind him, beautiful wife, beautiful son, beautiful farm, the most lovely, picture-perfect couple you'll ever imagine invested their life savings into creating a gun which overnight is prohibited. And it's a story we've seen in other contexts, in other fora. It's a story that is so difficult because there's no recompense, there's no recourse. They weren't even given the courtesy of a notification by the government. They found out from their customers that their gun had been prohibited, if I recall. That story you would have to be heartless to hear it and not see that they are victims. Because when you hear their story, it's not about gun rights. It's about a couple living the Canadian dream and being told by the government, no. When I 
was in Ottawa a couple of years ago for the Integrity March. It was memorable because you don't often see integrity in Ottawa. I looked around and I saw just how many people from all across the country had been there, united by something very fundamental to them, which was, we like guns, we like our rights, and we like integrity. And I thought that was such a brilliant concept to anchor that around, because it wasn't a gun rights march. It was a march for political integrity. And your life may be devoted in some way because of your business or your hobby or just what you like to do to the idea of firearms. And I think that's totally fine. I encourage you to do it. But guns are not just guns. Guns are so many other things. They are property. They are hobbies. They are in critical, critical moments, tools of self-defense, yes. They are also, most importantly, things. And everyone knows this. Everyone in this room knows it. Everyone outside the room knows it. They might not admit it. They are things that have no agenda of their own. People, different story, but we've talked about the people already. But they have to be situated in the broader context. And you may not be able to win people over on getting them to like the same things that you like. But you can win them over on the human faces of it. The people whose businesses have been jeopardized, whose sports have been jeopardized, whose public safety and personal safety may have been jeopardized, and whose rights have been jeopardized. Because if you stretch that out, you'll find that everyone can connect to some aspect of that. So with that, I am happy to take your questions, but it has been a pleasure to be here, so thank you very much.